recently, um, a couple spoke to me about their faith journey and how it led them to Torah class. They had been Mormons. They didn't find any great fault with their Mormonism or their Mormon community, but rather only that when it came to sermons and Bible teaching, it troubled them that what was being taught didn't seem to match what their Bible said. So they explored a couple of other well-known mainstream Christian denominations only to find the same troubling issue. And they simply wanted to know the truth. They wanted to know the unvarnished God's truth in order to live a life of truth, to live something that was pleasing to God. Now, you know, there can be a vast gulf between a community of God worshipers living lives of kindness and nicety and tolerance than those living lives of obedience to God. And this is what Hosea chapter 4 highlights, especially the words of verse 6, which say, My people are destroyed for want of knowledge. Because you rejected knowledge, I will also reject you as Kohen, as priest for me. Because you forgot the Torah of your God, I will also forget your children. Now, here the source of knowledge of God is directly pinned to the knowledge of the Torah. Every indication is that the people of the northern kingdom of Ephraim, Israel, were, were decent enough to one another, maybe even nice people. We know that they were quite tolerant, as they got along famously with their pagan neighbors and seemingly one another. And these particular virtues continue to be valued by modern societies, especially within the church. Yet, as we're learning in Hosea, kindness, nicety, tolerance must be defined by God's Torah, not by the societies of men. I want to pause here to make clear that in no way am I suggesting that the books of the New Testament fall outside of this knowledge. On the other hand, the New Testament did not change the dynamics and the principles and laws set down in the Torah as it is usually said to have. It affirmed them. Romans 3, 29 through 31. Or is the God, or is God the God of the Jews only? Isn't he also the God of the Gentiles? Yes, he is indeed the God of the Gentiles, because as you will admit, God's one. Therefore, he will consider righteous the circumcised on the ground of trusting and the uncircumcised through that same trusting. Does it follow that we abolish Torah by this trusting? Heaven forbid. On the contrary, we confirm Torah. Well, God is about to destroy the people of Israel, meaning destroying their kingdom and sending them scattered into the nations. Not because they weren't nice people, but rather because what they thought to be truth came from something else than God's Torah, which by definition means what they believed to be truth was not truth. And as so many of us know, in modern times, to follow God in truth and obedience and to take counsel on the whole Word of God feels like we're swimming, uh, swimming against a, a pretty strong current. The harder part of that struggle is that while we can understand that reality as it concerns secular humanist society, at times it feels as if we're swimming against that same current within institutional and normative Christianity. It would be so much easier if we could just be neutral, wouldn't it? 
lot easier. You know, if we could find a happy, comfortable place in the middle as kind of a religious Switzerland. And yet, God gives us no such option. There's truth, and there's not truth. Ephraim Israel wasn't intentionally abandoning Yehovah. They just wanted to exist in that middle ground. So Jeroboam's priests fashioned a new religion that brought part of their Hebrew faith along with them, added elements of pagan worship that was valued by their neighbors and friends, and subtracted anything that was controversial and might upset the peace. They wanted to get along among themselves and with their Gentile neighbors. Yehovah, through Hosea, responds with an emphatic no to that. And he is about to mete out devastating consequences for such a misguided attempt. Sir Hector Hetherington, who was for 25 years the president of the University of Glasgow in Scotland, spoke these intriguing words as regards a hard lesson about our earnest search for spiritual truth. He says this, There are issues on which it is impossible to be neutral. These issues strike right down to the roots of man's existence, and while it is right that we should examine all the evidence and make sure that we have all the evidence, it is equally right that we ourselves should be accessible to the evidence. We cannot live a full life without knowing exactly where we stand regarding these fundamental issues of life and destiny. Now, the concept of neutrality exists nowhere in the Bible. Neutrality is not part of God's character biblically, therefore it's not to be part of ours. To God, knowledge only means knowledge of His truth. Wisdom only means wisdom from heaven. And this kind of truth is not found in our nice thoughts or human law codes or on college campuses, nor in increased intellectualism. There is one source alone for it, the Bible. And more specifically, according to the Holy Scriptures, it's the Torah. Now, it's quite telling that in the final book of the Bible, Revelation, we find a teaching about the subject of neutrality and where spiritual knowledge is supposed to come from, but too often it does not. In Revelation 3, verses 14 through 19, to the angel of the Messianic community in Laodicea write, Here is the message from the Amen, the faithful and the true witness, the ruler of God's creation. I know what you're doing. You are neither cold nor hot. I wish you were either one or the other. So because you're lukewarm, neither cold nor hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. For you keep saying, I am rich. I've gotten rich. I don't need a thing. You don't know that you are the one who is wretched and pitiable and poor and blind and naked. My advice to you is to buy from me gold refined by fire, so that you may be rich, and white clothing, so that you may be dressed and not be have to be ashamed of your nakedness, and eye salve to rub on your eyes, so that you may see. Now, as for me, I rebuke and discipline everyone I love. So exert yourselves, turn from your sins. Now, these words could have been spoken to Ephraim Israel because they encapsulate exactly what God's telling them. Israel is lukewarm. They have created doctrines in order to be neutral. They have reshaped their formerly orthodox 
Hebrew faith in order to better get along in the world as it existed and as they wanted it to be. Israel has retained Jehovah, but added elements of their neighbor's religious beliefs in order to demonstrate their tolerance and their neutrality. Israel at this point in the book of Hosea was still very prosperous. I am rich. I have gotten rich. I don't need a thing. But to God, they were, spiritual speaking, speaking derelict. You don't know that you are the one who is wretched, pitiable, poor, blind, and naked. God in Hosea says that Israel is destroyed for lacking the knowledge of Torah. My advice to you is to buy from me gold refined by fire, so that you may be rich. White clothing, so that you may be dressed and not have to be ashamed of your nakedness. And for this lack of knowledge, the priests, who are supposed to be teachers of truth, they are blamed. Well, let's reread a portion of Hosea chapter 4. Open your Bibles to Hosea chapter 4, please. And we're going to start reading at verse 7. Verse 7. Follow along with me, please. The more they increased in number, the more they sinned against me. I will change their glory into shame. They feed on the sin of my people, are greedy for their crimes. But the Kohen, the priest, will fare no better than the people. I will punish him for his ways and pay him back for his deeds. They will eat but not have enough, consort with whores but have no children, because they stop listening to Adonai. Whoring and wine, both old and new, takes away my people's wits. My people consult their piece of wood, their diviner's wand speaks to them. For the spirit of whoring makes them err. They go off whoring, deserting their God. They sacrifice on the mountain peaks. They offer incense on the hills under oaks, poplars, pistachio trees, because they give good shade. Therefore, your daughters behave like whores, and your daughters-in-law commit adultery. I'm not going to punish your daughters when they act like whores, or your daughters-in-law when they commit adultery, because the men are themselves going off with whores and sacrificing with prostitutes. Yes, a people without understanding will come to ruin. Now, if you, Israel, prostitute yourself, still Judah has no need to incur such guilt. Don't go up to Gilgal or up to Beit Aven, and don't swear as Adonai lives, for Israel is stubborn as a stubborn cow. Will Adonai now feed them like a lamb in a big pasture? Ephraim is joined to the idols. Let him alone. When they finish carousing, they start their whoring. Their rulers deeply love dishonor. The wind will carry them off in its wings, and their sacrifices bring them nothing but shame. Now the they who increased in number were the priests of this hybridized religion of Ephraim Israel. It seems that the more the priests became attached, the more of them became attached to this priesthood, the even greater they sinned. How is that? It's because as a group expands and adopts the same troubled mindset, they find in it a validation for their thoughts and their behavior. However, because this groupthink amounted to idolatry and rebellion against Jehovah, they have exchanged their glory for shame. Now here we find another term, glory, that is so often misunderstood. See, just as wisdom is seen biblically as a living person of God. And as we have recently learned, so is the Word. Well, the glory is yet another manifestation of God. That is, their glory is a living entity. It's a proper name 
The prophet Jeremiah also exposes this name as a specific manifestation of God in Jeremiah 2, verses 10 through 12. Cross to the coasts of the Kittim and look. Send to Kedar and observe closely. See if anything like this has happened before. Has a nation ever exchanged its gods, and theirs are not gods at all, yet my people have exchanged their glory for something without value? Be aghast at this, you heavens. Shudder in absolute horror, says Adonai. So while in Hosea, knowledge that the glory is a name for a manifestation of God that's assumed, in Jeremiah it's explained. The glory is the God that the Hebrews exchanged for something without value, and it's an absolute horror. So to be clear, God is saying in Hosea 4-7 that Israel has exchanged their God, here going by the name of the glory, for gods of shame, the gods of the Baal system. So in verse 8, the priests are accused of feeding on the sins of the laymen of Israel. Now I love what Douglas Stewart in his commentary on Hosea says. He says this, Instead of teaching the people the nature of righteousness and motivating them to seek it, the priests are prospering via the Old Testament equivalent of selling indulgences. Now for you who might not know, an indulgence is a unique doctrine and practice of the Catholic Church. Okay? It stems from the belief that repentance for a sin is alone not sufficient. Rather, there must be a penalty suffered as well. And often, often this would involve a, a, a kind of a, a fine to be paid. And upon payment now for the indulgence, priests would grant remission of that sin. So in its fullest sense, indulgences are bought and sold. A person can pay a monetary amount and buy their way out of the guilt of having committed a sin. Now naturally, this is quite a profit center for the church. And while this is not precisely what was going on with the priesthood of Israel, it's a good analogy. The more the people sinned, all the more sin offerings had to be brought to the altar. And the greatest part of a sin offering was not burnt up but rather it was given to the priests. Further, at this time, because Israel had several holy sites with altars and priests to accompany them, then one can only imagine how many sin offerings were brought by the common people every day and how much the priests profited from it. So the priests' motivation was not to teach the people correctly, but rather to virtually lead people into the sin so that the priests could benefit from it, doing it all under the cover of religion. Now the conclusion and consequence for this situation is found in the next verse. Now the NAS version expresses it most literally, I think, most correctly. It says this, and it will be like people, like priests. So I will punish them for their ways and repay them for their deeds. See, the thought is that just as God is going to punish the people of Israel, their priests will not escape. They too will suffer right along with the people. Now, I'd like to give you an analogy that is meant only to help this verse impact us as it should. In the usual Christian understanding of the rapture event. Believers will be taken away to heaven while non-believers will be left behind. Now it is generally pictured that many churchgoers who are convinced 
in themselves that they are indeed believers and saved will be left behind because they are not truly faithful or they've been some kind of pretenders. However, it's kind of unimaginable to most that those left behind could ever be the men standing behind the pulpits. So while many laymen in the church might not be terribly surprised at not being raptured, it would be unthinkable to the men who went to seminary and who lead many in prayer and have dedicated their lives to leading congregations that they weren't included. The idea underlying verse 9 is that the priests in Ephraim, Israel, are certain. They must be exempt from God's punishment simply because they are priests. God says, not so fast. People and priest will be treated the same. Well, verse 10 refers back to verse 8. The eat but it will not be enough refers to the portions of the sin offerings that the priests receive. This is both literal and it's a metaphor. Not being enough means despite all they get, it's never enough. They always want more. You know, it's pretty human. The more we get, the more we want. Satisfaction and contentment with our particular level of abundance is only sometimes fulfilling, especially if our aim is to constantly increase our abundance. Simply put, the priests are greedy. They're unethical. And the remainder of the verse speaks of the priests consorting with prostitutes and having no children. This is because they paid no attention to God. Now the consequences listed here from the priest paying no attention to God, here meaning God's Torah, are hunger and childlessness. The curses are actually curses listed in the Torah for these particular offenses. At the same time, these results are both literal and symbolic. Their coming exile will indeed cause them hunger, lack of food, Prostitution means the priests indeed consorted with whores, and childless meant that because they left their seed in whores instead of their wives, they had no legitimate offspring to carry on their family line. On the other hand, symbolically speaking, their hunger will be spiritual in nature, as they will have lost their connection to God and they will be empty. And Jehovah sees them as having intimacy with prostitutes as a metaphor for the idolatry that they are committing against Him. Having no children means symbolically their careers as priests will have been another failure. Now verse 11, this shifts attention away from the priests and instead towards the population in general. Hosea 4.11, whoring and wine, both old and new, takes away my people's wits. Now, something I'd like you to notice is this. This verse speaks of both old wine and new wine. And they both take away the people's wits. Often in the church it is said that wine, yain, in Hebrew, isn't alcoholic, it's just grape juice. Or sometimes it's said that old wine might have alcohol in it, new wine is just grapes that haven't gone through the fermentation process yet, and thus it's just grape juice. None of this is accurate. New wine means it comes from a recent harvest, and indeed has fermented, but has a relatively low alcohol content suitable for religious ritual, compared to older wine that has only gotten stronger with time. So I'm going to paraphrase this verse to give you the sense of it. Okay? The people have become so eager to drink and get drunk 
that it has driven them to the brink of madness. Pleasure has become everything at any cost, and they derive their pleasure from excessive drinking and then making the typical bad decisions that come from that inebriated and therefore uninhibited state of mind. Now, for the men, indulging their sexual lusts with prostitutes has gone hand in hand with their drunkenness. See, it's important we understand that most men were married. It's just the culture. So, we are to understand that they have whores they visit even though they have wives at home. Now, I say this now because some verses coming up require that we know that. Verse 12 then draws a parallel between these drunken sexual lusts and how this affects their spiritual relationship with Jehovah. Verse 12 says, My people consult their piece of wood, their diviner's wand speaks to them, for the spirit of whoring makes them err. They go off whoring, deserting their God. Now, the same mindset that allows them to commit these debaucheries and to behave in such an immemorial way is entirely connected to their worship practices. The piece of wood they consult is not an idol. Okay? It is further defined as the diviner's wand. Now, it's probably referring to a stick that was stood up in the center of a circle. And the circle would have different words written in different sectors of that circle. And a diviner, a priest, would let go of the stick and it would fall into one of the sectors such that wherever it did land was considered as the divine answer from God for their inquiry. Well, Jehovah here mocks this entire religious ritual as nonsense. What causes his people to do this absurd thing? Their spirit of whoring, metaphorically meaning idolatry, and the result is to desert Jehovah. And yet, their spirit of whoring, again, idolatry, is directly connected to actual whoring with prostitutes. Now, folks, from a 30,000 foot view, here's what we're to understand from this. In God's eyes, there is no way to separate our spiritual life from our physical life. In reality, we can't either. A demented spiritual viewpoint and a demented physical life and behavior is directly connected. That doesn't mean that perhaps we hold a couple of questionable doctrinal views about God that we're going to become pleasure-seeking party animals and sex addicts. But there is some line in the sand out there that once our spiritual understanding strays far enough from actual truth, it will have a terrible effect on our earthly life and vice versa. I don't think an illustration is even needed. Because drug use and alcoholism and all of its awful effects are so visible and rampant in Western societies that all we have to do is pay attention instead of becoming dulled to it. You know, I think it's probably close to non existent that you could find a person who lives in a perpetual drug or alcohol induced haze who has any kind of an actual relationship with God that God accepts. See, this is the sort of thing that verse 12 is speaking about. Well, verse 13 continues the same thought. Verse 13, they sacrifice on the mountain peaks and offer incense on the hills under oaks, poplars, pistachio trees, because they give good shade. Therefore, your daughters behave like whores and your daughters-in-law commit adultery. Now, while there is some scholarly disagreement over exactly what species of trees are being listed, the meaning's clear. See, it was the usual mode 
that when a, a, a pagan holy site was selected for worship by Baal religions, that they would pick a, a, a hilltop. And up there they would erect a small altar and, and they would plant a tree. Or they found a pre-existing tree on a hilltop and they built an altar uh, under it. Now, that the tree has good shade, it's meant as sarcasm. Okay. They did it because these trees represented fertility, and thus the fertility goddess Ashtoreth. Shade was a side benefit. Now, recent finds throughout the hill country of Israel have unearthed these sites all over the place. Anyone that felt like making their own holy site did so, and often it was just out of convenience. It's like going to church because it's the closest one to your house. Now, like many of the animal sacrifices that took place at these many altars were dedicated to Jehovah, and yet with overtones of it also having some effect in their worship of Baal as well. For Hebrews, the offering of any sacrifices other than in Jerusalem is expressly forbidden by the Torah, as was eating any portion of the sacrifice as concerned the priests. And as a result, the daughters and the daughters-in-law of the men who had performed these illicit rituals behaved like prostitutes and they committed adultery. Now once again, improper understanding of God results in improper worship of God, which results in family dysfunction and immoral behavior. Verse 14 follows up with something truly extraordinary. God says, pay attention to this, I'm not going to punish your daughters when they act like whores, or your daughters-in-law when they commit adultery. Why? Because the men are themselves going off with whores and sacrificing with prostitutes. Yes, a people without understanding will come to ruin. See, the sense of this is not that these women get a pass for their immoral behavior. Rather, it is the men are blamed for it. Despite the fact that by Christ's day adultery was considered by the Jews as a, only a female crime, and despite a belief by many in the church that in the Old Testament women were held to a different standard than men when it came to marriage and sex, that simply isn't true. Now, did Israelite society regularly try to reframe God's Torah to make it to the benefit of the males only constantly? There's no denying that Israel was always a male-dominant society, and there's no denying a dominant family role that males are to play according to the Torah, yet women were not treated as cattle, not second-class citizens, nor was it that women didn't have rights. Men were not given a pass for the same sins that women might commit, especially when it came to marital unfaithfulness. Even so, it had been a nearly continuous custom to set women in the back seat and simply weak at, uh, wink rather at the sexual sins of the males. So, God is saying this in verse 14, men, men, I am not about to condemn your women and then look the other way for you. You think it's fine for you to commit adultery by having sex with these whores, but then turn around and you want severe punishment for your daughters, and by extension your wives, for becoming the whores that other men visit. Pretty strong stuff. See, he says, look, this entire society is so out of control and wicked because you have no understanding of what's right and what's wrong. This entire society is utterly ruined 
Men, women, husbands, wives, sons, daughters, a whole lot of you. I want to briefly touch on something that the more time goes by, the more I learn, I guess, I'm a little less convinced about. That something is called cult prostitution. That is, that the various pagan god systems had women that worked for them in which ritual sex was performed as a regular worship practice. Now, it's not so much that I don't think that it happened. I'm just more and more coming to the conclusion that it was not as rampant and as usual as it is regularly thought to have been, and was actually kind of an outlier. So the increase of that activity seems to have occurred mainly at various pagan festivals, (laughs) likely had to do with a population influx of males looking for a good time. And so, kind of like cotton candy vendors at a fair, the prostitutes came out in droves to take advantage of the crowds. This as opposed to an increase of prostitution for purely religious reasons. Now, what was just said in verse 14 is now followed by what is really a parenthetical statement in verse 15. It says, if you, Israel, prostitute yourself, Still Judah has no need to incur such guilt. Don't go up to Gilgal or up to bet Avon and don't swear as Adonai lives. See, there are a number of Bible academics that don't think this statement belongs here. That rather, it was a gloss that was added much later. Now, I, I just don't find that credible. There's no good reason to decide that this statement doesn't belong here because it was earlier established in Hosea that these circumstances don't currently apply to Judah. This seems to be a veiled call for those of Israel who desire to live a different and better lifestyle than their brothers to go to Judah where they weren't committing idolatry. And in the end, then they wouldn't suffer exile. God says to those Israelites that might be heeding Hosea's message to turn from their ways and to not go up to Gilgal or to bet Avon in order to worship, and further they shouldn't swear. Now this means don't make an oath at those places, probably inappropriately using God's name as the guarantor of that oath. So, what was wrong with worshiping at Gilgal or Beit Aben? Well, Gilgal was actually where the wilderness tabernacle was set up for a while, after all the tribes of Israel crossed over the Jordan River, although there, was, there were more than just one Gilgal. However, in time, the tabernacle went into disrepair. A lot of wrong worship practices occurred there, so that it gained a pretty bad reputation. Beit Aven means house of trouble. Very likely what this is actually referring to is the place called Beit El, house of God. See, in literature, what we're, what we're seeing here is called a metonymy. And it, what is it is, it's a sarcastic rebuke by giving a name to something that's the opposite of its original meaning. The place was actually called House of God, but it had become so degraded that a more appropriate name for it would be House of Trouble. Now, it's a little like how Las Vegas is also called Sin City. I mean, Las Vegas merely means the meadows. If you've ever been there, I have no idea where a meadow is. But it means a peaceful place. But what actually goes on there characterizes it more as a place of partying and sinning. Bethel, Beit El, was one of the main places where the Ephraim Israelite worship practices occurred and likely had one of Jeroboam's golden calves placed there. Well, I want to jump back up to the 30,000 foot level. 
to see if we can get the gist of what's being said here. The prophet Amos, who was a contemporary of Hosea, speaking of the same issue, says this in his prophecy. We find this in Amos chapter 5, verses 21 through 23. He says this, and this is God speaking. I hate, I utterly loathe your festivals. I take no pleasure in your solemn assemblies. If you offer me a burnt offering and grain offerings, I won't accept them. Nor will I consider the peace offerings of your stall-fed cattle. Spare me the noise of your songs. I don't want to hear the strumming of your lutes. God says, any old worship at any old place isn't accepted just because you call on my name. In fact, it's kind of infuriating to me that you would even try to. It's worse than if you did nothing at all. And as a kind of companion message in this passage to, do, to Judah, God is saying to them, don't do what Israel's doing. Things are going to be a lot happier for you if you abstain. So let's reestablish that throughout Hosea, the study, uh, our Hosea study, the underlying cause for Israel's punishment is breaking their covenant with God, breaking the covenant of Moses. Hosea 4.16, for Israel is stubborn as a stubborn cow. Will Adonai now feed them like a lamb in a big pasture? So Israel goes from being characterized as a cow to that of a lamb. A cow that doesn't want to be led can be very hard to move. No matter which way you push, that animal always seems to go in a different direction. Israel has become so hardened that God can no longer be a shepherd to his people. A lamb is vulnerable. They must be more carefully cared for and protected than a cow. But how can God treat a lamb like a lamb when it acts like a stubborn, immovable cow? Notice how suddenly this narrative begins to use terms about raising domestic animals when before it was using marriage terms and terms about prostitution, prostitution and debauchery. See, this terminology is selected because the people that God is talking to is familiar with them. It would be like in modern times, God might liken our behavior to that of cars, or tell us about things in terms of the internet or smartphones. These things are part of our everyday lives, so we all, have, we all have some knowledge of them, and therefore they make for good illustrations. Now verse 17 says that since Ephraim is so extensively joined to idol, they should be left alone. Now notice, first of all, the use of the name Ephraim all by itself. This indicates that the names Ephraim Israel, Northern Kingdom, they all mean the same place. But it also says that other than that the punishment of exile is coming, nothing further to dissuade them, to coax them away from their unacceptable condition is going to happen. Their fate before God is fixed. It's not changeable. It would be a waste of time waste of God's time to make any more effort to try to reform them. Might you believe that with the advent of Jesus that this harshness and this severity of a worshiper of God being barred from his forgiveness and deliverance for their wrongdoing is now a thing of the past? Listen to Matthew 7 verses 20 through 23. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, didn't we prophesy in your name? Didn't we expel demons in your name? Didn't we perform miracles in your name? Well, then I'll tell them to their faces, 
I never knew you. Get away from me, you workers of lawlessness. The NAS Bible version does a much better job with this next verse in Hosea than does the complete Jewish Bible. Verse 18 says, Their liquor gone, they play the harlot continually. Their rulers dearly love shame. Their liquor is gone. Just means that they have imbibed so much, they just can't drink anymore. And now they turn to another even worse activity. They play the harlot. Now clearly this is a case of mostly symbolism. That is, after making themselves drunk and irrational, they take on the role of the community harlot. This is in the sense of the wife that is so drunk, she doesn't know what she's doing, so she becomes unfaithful to her husband. And as I said at our introduction to Hosea, we don't really have a good copy in our day of Hosea that's fully intact. This particular verse is particularly problematic. And so what these words actually are or are communicating is pretty tough to obtain. So rather than just add speculation to speculation, we're just going to move on to the final verse of chapter 4, verse 19, where it says, The wind will carry them off on its wings, and their sacrifices bring them nothing but shame. Now we probably have a play on words here. The term, the wind, is in Hebrew, ruach. And as you might know, it's the same word used for spirit. It seems to me that if it is a play on words, that on the one hand being carried off by the wind means Israel's exile to wherever the wind blows them. On the other hand, it's also probably a reference to the prostituting spirit that God says now characterizes Israel. Therefore, as a result of this prostituting spirit, their sacrifices to Jehovah amount to shame because he doesn't accept them. Let's move on to chapter 5. Open your Bibles back up to Hosea chapter 5. Hosea chapter 5. We'll just barely get started in it. Follow along with me, please. Hosea chapter 5, verse 1. <clears throat> Hear this, Kohanim, priests. Pay attention, house of Israel. Listen, house of the king. For judgment is coming to you. You have become a snare for Mitzpah and a net spread over Tabor. The rebels have deepened their slaughter, and I am rejected by all of them. I know, Ephraim, Israel's not hidden from me. For now, Ephraim, you are a whore, Israel's defiled. Their deeds will not allow them to return to their God, for the spirit of whoring is in them. They don't know Adonai. Israel's arrogance will testify in his face. Israel and Ephraim will stumble, stumble in their crimes. Judah, too, will stumble with them. With their flocks and herds, they will go in search of Adonai, but they won't find him. He has withdrawn from them. They have betrayed Adonai by fathering foreign children. And now within the month, the invaders will devour their lands. Blow the shofar in Gibeah a trumpet at Ramah, sound an alarm at Beit Avon. Behind you, Benjamin, Ephraim will be laid waste when the day for punishment comes. I am announcing to the tribes of Israel what will surely happen. The leaders of Judah are like men who move boundary stones. I will pour my fury out upon them like water. Ephraim is oppressed, crushed by the judgment, because he deliberately sought out futility. Therefore I am like a moth to Ephraim, like rottenness to the house of Judah. And when Ephraim saw his sickness and Judah his wound, Ephraim went to Asher, and he sent envoys to a warring king. But he can't heal you, he can't cure your wound. For to Ephraim I'll be like a lion, and like a young lion to the house of Judah. I will tear them up and go away. I'll carry them off and no one will rescue. I will go and return to my place till they admit their guilt and search for me, 
seeking me eagerly in their distress. Verse 1 is a summons to judgment. And three different groups are told to present themselves before God. First, Israel's priests. Second, the people themselves. And third, the royal family, the king, Israel's rulers. This is representative, then, of every level of Israel's society. None are going to be spared. Their crimes have thus been laid out in earlier chapters, and now the verdict is being read. The priests are mentioned first, probably because in God's eyes they bear the most responsibility for having led God's chosen people away from truth, installing instead a man-made poisonous concoction of false beliefs and worship practices. God says that Israel, all of it, has entangled Mitzpah in a snare, an animal trap. There were a number of Mitzpahs in Israel, with the one located in Benjamin's territory perhaps the most well known. Now it seems unlikely this is the Mitzpah being referred to since Benjamin was part of Judah, not Israel, and since it's hard to see where either of these two places mentioned, Mitzpah then Tabor, have any logical reason to be singled out, it might be that they are only mentioned to be a sort of random representative of, the, of, of many places in Israel. Otherwise, it's entirely unclear. Now, that said, some fairly recent reconstructions of verse 2 seem to say a net stretched over Tabor a pit dug deep at Shittim, but I'm a chastiser for you all. See, it appears that if this new reconstruction is correct, there might be a third place mentioned called Shittim. Now, Shittim means acacia tree. And the significance of Shittim is, is that it is the final place that all of Israel encamped on the east side of the Jordan before being led across it to Jericho by Joshua. Further, it has an additional connection that becomes evident. When we go to the Torah and we read about Shittim, a place called Shittim, in the book of Numbers, in Numbers 25.1 it says this, Israel stayed at Shittim, and there the people began whoring with the women of Moab. See the connection? The mention of whoring at Shittim can't be coincidental. And it seems to marry quite well with the whoring that God has been accusing Israel of. Okay, we're going to stop here for today and we'll pick up next time. Okay. Help support God's people by purchasing items made by them, merchandise with a meaning, products with a purpose. HolyLandMarketplace.com. For more teachings, visit, support, or donate at TorahClass.com. Join with us in worship and enjoy God's Word at Seat of Abraham Fellowship.